Hello. Uh, oh, see the lights went off in the back. Don't fall asleep up there. All right, good evening. Welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you whom I have not met, my name is Joan Du. I'm the Dean of the Faculty and, and I want to, on behalf of the school, welcome you all for joining us tonight. Uh, today is the last event of our winter 2023 public program and we are, we are very much ending with a very exciting, not a bang, but certainly a boom. Um, our guest lecture tonight is a very special one from a very unique design practice whose work crosses many disciplinary boundaries. And we're looking forward to hearing about their work situated at our uniquely interdisciplinary faculty here. Before we begin though, uh, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work and study on this land. The name of the avenue we're on, Espadina, Espadina comes from the Anishinaabe term, Espadina, meaning a place on a hill. We note this and many layers of pasts of this site, and we wish to honor these connections and histories as we move forward together. Tonight's speaker, um, Linda Neri, knows a lot about connections and the interconnectivity of the world and the many fields of design. Based in Shanghai, Lyndon and his partner, Rosanna Hu, founded Neri and Hu Design and Research Office with a core vision, quote, to respond to a global worldview incorporating overlapping design disciplines for a new paradigm in architecture. Their practices, a wide, widely arranged portfolio ranges from master planning to architecture to interior design, furniture, product design, installations and exhibition, as well as to branding and graphic work all executed with high position and always a very strong conceptual voice. Currently on projects in many countries, Naren Hu has been recognized with countless awards over the years. Um, Linda, I, ne I jokingly asked someone to look up how many awards you've gotten in the past decade, and I got research to say in the last year alone, it was 30. So we didn't bother with the previous nine years. So among just those in the last year, uh, they have received Design for Asia Gold Award for their Chuan Melt Whiskey Distillery and Interior Design Magazine Best of the Year Award for their weekend series uh, of contract seating, and both an Alcazar A Plus Award and a HD Award for their Fuzhou Tea House. This is just in the past year. Amazing. And this very last project, by the way, is very indicative of their approach because not only does the work trans transcend discipline and categories, but also in function and in passage of time. Many of the office's architectural interior projects are repurposing and re-adaptations, often house. retrofitting what may be regarded as obsolete buildings and structures, including ruins, which is the main subject tonight and they turn them into functional and beautiful new entity to be embedded with new lives and new energy for the future. So uh, with that, I will, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce a, a, a longtime colleague and friend, Linda Neri, to the stage. Can you hear me? Oh, that's loud. Okay. Uh, before I delved into uh, the word rhinophilia and ruins, I decided today that I'm going to talk about our practice as a whole, because uh, I received many Instagram messages, <laughs> um, I guess with all these social platform, uh, asking me to show some work, some of the newer work. Unfortunately, I'm not showing them, so I decide to um, start with a, f a few of these uh, to kind of put our practice within the context uh, of what I'm talking about in relationship to ruins and the idea of rhinophilia. Uh, but uh, Dean Du, thank you uh, for inviting me over. Uh, this is my third time uh, in um, Toronto. 
the first time was extremely cold, and I decided that I was not going to come back. Uh, but uh, through the kindness of Bridget and Howard, uh, who's also in this room, uh, they convinced me that uh, Toronto is not so bad. Uh, so I came again the second time around a lot better, and this is my third time, so I'm extremely uh, excited. Uh, I have heard so much about this program. Um, a friend of mine, Nadir, did design this school, so uh, I know it very well. Uh, I know it even before I visited the school. Uh, today, uh, I, this is not so much a title, but um, this is sort of uh, the title of our monograph, and I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit as to why I'm going to start with this before I talk about concepts. Um, so this is our home uh, in, Shang in Shanghai, and this is our office. Um, so let me start this lecture by quoting literary critic and Shakespearean scholar Terence Hawkes, who once said, the true nature of things may be said to lie not in things themselves, but in the relationships which we construct and then perceive between them. The notion of traversing between space, time, and practice has long been embedded in Nguyen Hu's architectural practice. In fact, a current exhibition of the studio work in the Ada's Gallery in Berlin showed 17 years of work in progress. We say work in progress because our work is never complete. In fact, even when it's handed over to the client, it continues to live uh, on its own, and to a certain extent, we do have a certain responsibility of figuring out how they work and how to navigate between those thresholds that we have inhabited for a long period of time. This lecture will examine a series of contemporary issues in various global contexts and aims to shed light on how the firm grounds its work. I know many of you have written and asked for a better description of this particular space, which is recently published or recently completed. Uh, this is our latest project. It's an extension to our Muriel Museum and the Western Hotel in the ancient city of Xi'an, famous for the terracotta warriors. This shows that our work not only crossed between locations, culture, but also between typologies. But I'm not going to show this work uh, <clears throat> because time is of essence, and so I have to kind of limit my, um, uh, the amount of work I'm showing. Uh, in the process of that inquiry, we maintain an intellectual inquiry into adaptive reuse, and the role of history, reimagined spatial legibility associated with uh, voyeurism, tectonics, and the use of poche, a search for a connection back to the vernacular. In this case, for a new headquarter for a pastry factory in Beijing that just recently completed as well. And of course, the role of collective memory, reflective nostalgia, ruins, fragments, or the idea of rhinophilia. We use the word thresholds because we find that we are always working with the ideas of the in-between. Even in-between dealing with many different clients and their, their needs. A small Italian pizza, for instance, in the middle of Paris, owned by a Parisian and yet helmed by a famous Japanese chef. Rather confusing, uh, rather distorted, um, very interesting, uh, but you have to say yes to all of their requests and yet just do your own thing. Threshold with different variations, often crossing divides that tradition, institutions, society, or even what our profession has predetermined. The obvious divide, you can say, are past, future, east, west, global, local, urban, rural, interior, exterior. But other more nuanced divides, we feel, have over the years become themes that helps us analyze our own work, projects, and in fact, today, I'll be organizing my talk using those themes, one of them being ruins and rhinophilia, to describe many of our projects. This is the Shanghai Theater project we did about seven years ago, um, and that set foot on a number of cultural projects uh, that we started working on. As a practice, this place we call home, Shanghai or China, sets the stage for our design exploration. This is also the title of our second monograph, threshold, space, time, and practice. The entry of the office became the cover of our new monograph published last year by Thames and Hudson. Before moving 
uh, to projects or showing you our projects, let me set the context of where we work and explain a few key concepts for you to understand the ideas behind each final design. Forgive the oversimplification and generalization, but due to time, I won't be able to go too deeply into any one of them, but hopefully the gist of what we're trying to uh, express through the built work will be conveyed, uh, conveyed clearly. So many of our work respond to the ever-pressing problem in China related to the broader subject of sustainability and restoration, often di discussed in terms of urban or adaptive reuse. Since 1990, one out of six families in China have been evicted and relocated. In fact, our office was such a victim four years ago. We were given three weeks to move from our old office to find a new premise. You can imagine how crazy and absurd that was. But we have no choice, because if we were to practice in this city we call home, that was just part of life. The intense development over the last 20 years has forced a city like Shanghai, not just Shanghai, but since this is our home, this is how I'm going to focus, to confront with the aftermath of demolition, the erosion of traditional urban and cultural fabric. Notice this is the exact time period that we, both Rosanna and I, have been living and working in Shanghai. While the city must develop rapidly, we seek to find alternative modes to design and build. Here we enter into a related but more complex issue of architecture as a means of cultural production and identity. Left is Michael Wolff's uh, photography that rep represents this anonymous urbanization. For those of you that are from Hong Kong, that's very obvious. You say, yeah, that is from Hong Kong by this amazing German photographer. But if you've never been to Asia, many of this anonymous um, uh, city that looks like this photograph could be mistaken as Shanghai, for instance, or another city uh, in China. On the right is a typical Shanghai lane house, unique in character and rich in tradition. The di di dichotomy of modernity and tradition seems to be contrasting opposites. But maybe, and just maybe, there's a coexisting balance between the two extremes like this bronze lion from Jia Zhangke's film in 2010, entitled, I Wish I Knew. Architects like us wish we knew. This image is really powerful. This was featured in New York Times, wherein this lion perhaps was perhaps the only permanent um, motif or remnant. The rest was demolished because this probably had good fortune in it. And you see the building next to it, which is another layer that could potentially be demolished and the possibility of new city beyond. But like the film's magnificent scenery, when faced with loss and destruction, we often retreat back to nostalgia. When I use the word nostalgia, and many of you that follow our work might understand what we've talked about, but this nostalgia is very different. It's not so much as stylistic, or yearning just purely of the past. Nostos in Greek means homecoming, and algos means pain or ache. The ache and the pain of wanting to go home. Nostalgia, therefore, can be understood as a longing for home to the point of deep pain. Architecturally, it is like our desire to preserve a historic building or a city, to be frozen in time, like the Acropolis or Xi'an terracotta warriors to name a few. It is disturbing to a point where in my children who grew up in Shanghai, every time, every six weeks, or maybe two months, things would rapidly change around our neighborhood, neighborhood to a point where it's disheartening for some of them. Yes, it's just an ice cream store, or maybe it's just another toy store for them, but you can imagine the psyche that goes through their little head. Svetlana Boim wrote extensively about this in The Future of Nostalgia, and she called this type of attitude for preservation restorative nostalgia, a literal reconstruction of the lost home. Another way to think about nostalgia, however, which is something that we relate more, is reflective nostalgia, which is more of a longing for home. Even if you may never arrive home, 
but it's okay because in the process, something innovative and creative happens. What does this mean? Perhaps going home is not so straightforward. Perhaps it's not the most efficient. Perhaps it's not from one point to another that you know so well. Perhaps it's through the interstitial spaces or what Homi Baba coined as the third space in architecture. Perhaps it is through the back of house, through the alleyways, through the interstitial spaces that you meander and in the process of meandering, you find a process or a, po uh, a moment of home that feels makes you comfortable. Maybe you never arrived. Speaking of past history, nostalgia, we also find reflective nostalgia has an uncanny similarity to the Eastern idea of ruins. This is where ruinophilia comes to play. Very different from that of the West. The English word for ruin originated in the idea of falling, like fallen stones, and on the left is the Roman ruins of the Forum. Many of you are probably familiar with that, with that image. This material of stones, fallen stones, is what makes the ruin and create the romantic notion of ruins as a visual aesthetic. But if we turn to the right image, a painting by Shi Tao, in his Yellow Mountain series, that material remnant is mis missing in this painting about ruins. No building or stones are present anywhere. Whereas the Chinese notion of ruins is less overtly tied to visual remnants, it is instead evoked through absence and voids. And here, the imagery of ancient tree, which you see right smack in the middle, rather than building, symbolizes both death, decay, as well as rebirth. If we were to dig further, we find that the earliest term used for ruins in Chinese is the character Chiu, meaning a mound of rubble, denoting the ruined site. During the Eastern Zhou period, Xu replaced the term for ruins, whereas Chiu refers to a topographic feature, Xu is primarily a signifier of emptiness. This is not just a phenomena within the Chinese um, idea of ruins, but also in many ways the Japanese. On the right is an example of Chiu, the remains of a palace in Sanxi province from the third century uh, BC, which is literally a mound of rubble. Shown here next to Tintern Abbey, considered a perfect ruin by Thomas Watley in 1772, where the original structure is visible and the erosion is identifiable and romantic. Unlike European architectural ruins, Chinese ruins no longer convey their original grandeur. The superstructures have disappeared, leaving only foundations in the form of a rubble. The Chinese concept of ruin is dependent on this notion of erasure and void, resulting from the absence of the original. You might say, well, that Western romantic aesthetic, or as Regal would theorize, its age value, meaning how old is this brick to show you how valuable the building is, seems to be in the Chinese visual memory too. But in fact, it is somewhat manufactured by the West. Like these two images behind me, they both portray Chinese decayed structure. But they were produced in Italy and France. In fact, from the fifth century, B.C. to the mid-19th century A.D., only five or six artworks in China depicted ruined buildings. This is from the art historian uh, Wu Hong's research. Um, he's from University of Chicago, and he had written this book about five years ago, which was an amazing enlightenment uh, for both Rosanna and myself. What does this mean? It means that the concept of ruin in China is an internalized concept and not the romantic aesthetic we have learned in art history. Take Shi Tao's Qingliang Terrace. He shows no trace of damaged architecture, even if the inscription is about broken roofs and ruin entrenchment. But ruins are profoundly internalized in our literary tradition through the genre huai, huai gu poetry. I spent on these two insights, namely reflective nostalgia and the internalized notion of ruins. When I talk about ruins, I'm not saying one is better than the other. All I'm trying to point out is the different attitude 
in understanding ruins. I focus on these two because they inspired us to look at the past differently and gave us alternative strategies to reconfigure historic remnants. Svetlana's premise, I'm going to go to the project soon, so I know a lot of you architects just want to see projects, but just bear with me. Svetlana Boyne's premise that nostalgia offers a productive means to engage with issues of collective memory, displacement, and urban renewal, embracing the contradiction of modernity. Boyne also highlighted the link between contemporary rhinophilia and reflective nostalgia, remarking that ruins lead, leads one to contemplate the past that could have been, as well as the future that never took place. So with that, let's go to the first project, a project that many of you are probably familiar with, uh, but I'm going to show it anyways. So the first project I'll be showing you is technically our very first architectural work. We did mostly interior for the first five years when we moved back to China, but this opportunity was presented to us about 13 years ago. Even though it is familiar and old, I've included it in this lecture because I think it sets the stone sets the tone for the subject of rhinophilia and threshold and the idea of urban reuse. So it was on the South Bund. I was really excited uh, when I was given this opportunity, thinking we were given the opportunity to transform one of the 33 uh, buildings on the Majestic uh, Bund. Uh, of course, when we got this call, my partner, Rosanna, says, no, that can't be. She's the humble one, and I'm the arrogant one. So I said, of course we, we deserve it. You can imagine, I've not even done any architectural work. And for me to think that I have the audacity to think that I could transform one of these 33. Well, I was wrong. This was what we got. So I was rather shocked. I remember walking across this, and I'm like, what's happened to the grandeur of the majestic? And I forgot it was south of the bun. But I was even more shocked to find out that the client had no intention of keeping this building whatsoever. They had limited budget, and what they wanted to do was to recreate London Mayfair. And so that was my second shock. The brief to say, we would love to demolish this building and for you to do a brick building, and we have images of classical Mayfair in London. So such is the case and the beginning of Waterhouse at South Bun. It was an original army building initially to be demolished. They've gone through the planning, no problem, no plaque, no signage, therefore not worth preserving. I realized then I have two choices, to follow the brief and do a brick building that looks like Mayfair, Perhaps I could tweak John Sohn and make it interesting um, or be what Sergison Bates does very well <laughs> in London or take over this and make something out of this anomaly. I decided that this was more important, so I told the client that this would be cheaper. I lied. <laughs> Architecture students, <laughs> the first thing you do in the practical world you can't always tell the truth. The preservation culture in Shanghai was very much in the restorative vein as described by Svetlana Boim. So it was all about preservation to the T. So you can imagine the client, when I talk about preservation, they thought I was just going to keep it as is. And so we start sketching and the possibility of having new addition to make it quite interesting. And managed to convince the client that this was not only the cheaper alternative, but will give a certain identity for all of them to understand and be proud of. The architectural concept behind this renovation clearly rests on the idea of old and new, outside and inside, and the, this particular entrance uh, to the lobby, uh, we heighten it to give you that sense of entry, which is expressed through both a blurring of the interior and exterior, as well as between the public and the private realms, creating a disoriented yet refreshing journey. We saw this opportunity as a way to uniquely show a different type of Shanghai, a Shanghai that hopefully a traveler would enjoy as opposed to a tourist 
that have a checkbox of what they need to see. The tallest tower, you know, Xin Tian Di, Huangpu River, and they see Shanghai. That was very disturbing to me. Obviously, the client was not expecting this. In fact, my parents didn't expect this. So when they visited us, they were very excited. Imagine, after sending me to school, graduate school, uh, paying for a lot of my uh, education, they were like, finally, he's an architect and he gets to build. And so he's, this is the first impression of this building. So my moms and my father, both my dad and my mom, they started laughing hysterically. And so my mom has a question, goes, can I ask you a question? Is this project complete, son? I said, it's completely done. He says, second question, did the client pay you in full? I said, yes, the client paid me in full. So my mother said, uh, it's either you're extremely brilliant uh, or the client's really stupid. I think it's somewhere in between. Um, so from the ramps that move up and down the atrium space, the guest gains unconventional interiors perspective into other rooms, to adjacent buildings as well as out towards the city. This condition is very much similar to all the lane houses in Shanghai. And we thought, if you were to stay in a hotel, why be comfortable? Why be in a place where in all the five-star amenities, I know there are no people from Hyatt or Hilton or Rich Carlton or Amman perhaps here, really does not tell or talk about the city that they inhabit. So we decided, perhaps maybe stupidly, to unearth many of these important aspect of what we call the local urban condition, where visual corridors and adjacencies in tight lane houses define our very unique experience. To a point where in the restaurant we had slits open and people thought it was skylight. No, it wasn't. You, uh, it allows you to look at bedrooms. And from the bedrooms, you actually can look down. Very similar to the condition of the lane houses in Shanghai. In fact, my bathroom, being the modernist that I am, have a big glass like this. This is not my house, very similar. And often I forget when I don't close my shade, uh, the auntie across from me, which is only about three meters away, it's her kitchen. Sometimes she looked at me and I realized I'm butt naked. Um, so you know, because in the afternoon, being the goss, uh, you know, how the lane houses are, there's a lot of gossip. She starts telling me, you know, you've really gained a little bit of weight. That means she saw me, right? But you would be standing here in this room, looking down at the restaurant through the slit above the dining room that we just saw, and here one bedroom looks into another room, similar to the condition of the lane houses in Shanghai. I realize that parents actually like this, especially when they bring their kids, uh, because they have full control over you know, what they do with their computers. So the spe sectional qualities very much like the lane houses are prevalent everywhere. We also use part of the existing wood structure. Uh, some of them uh, were um, kind of uh, already uh, completely uh, uh, destroyed and dilapidated. Some of them were still in existence. Uh, we use it as our louver. And obviously, the, the whole dialogue between outside and inside uh, using different materials to give that reflection and adjacency. Uh, this is the cheapest room. You check in and your bedroom is up above. Uh, it got to a point that um, we lost a few projects after this opened. This was about 10 years ago. Some of our clients decided that we're either making fun. In fact, the tourism board was not very happy. They thought we were making fun of them. Uh, it took another two years when David Beckham and his wife came to Shanghai and rented the whole hotel. Uh, David and Victoria Beckham, the soccer star. I know, I know we're in Canada, so it's, uh, this is hockey world. Um, when I speak in America, it's the basketball world. So you uh, probably can't relate, but you, you know who David Beckham is. And all of a sudden, the tourism board goes, oh, these architects must know something. And all of a sudden came to us and made this project the uh, front cover of their tourism uh, board's uh, brochure. It takes a star in another industry to confirm what we do. Very sad, very sad indeed. That's how bad we have it as architects and designers. But we have kept all the existing stairways. The existing uh, stairways, um, we were told, 
uh, was storage for some illegal drugs at one point in the 1930s and the 40s, uh, and therefore a lot of these stairways uh, led you to nowhere, so apparently when the cops come, um, they would be so confused. So we decided that it's perfect to keep that. The bar was up above, the rooftop bar, we're in the bar table so you actually can look down. And these became the in-between, the interstitial space uh, upon entering the room. The client actually wanted to maximize this and wanted to just take over this, demolish this, but I said, you know what? You don't have money for artwork, so this becomes your artwork. Again, that was my way of um, using what I called white lie to convince a particular architectural uh, intervention. So we kept many of these existing stairway with our uh, patina kept intact. Some staircase led to nowhere, um, and yet this project recomposed memories of the city that would have otherwise uh, been demolished. So we have made a conscious effort uh, the last 10 years to document our projects uh, with video to bring about the spatial qualities in architecture that we are interested in. And at the same time, allow people that do not have the opportunity to visit Shanghai or China or the places that we build to be able to experience our projects spatially. We believe that images, photographs, and drawings are not good enough. I'm not saying video is perfect, but it's closer to at least a spatial quality. In Nier and Hu's adaptive reuse projects, the ruin operates as the muse whose power is to elicit visceral experiences to create a connection to the past. However, the basis for adaptive reuse and even some of the seemingly ground up projects more often than not are actually non-romantic relics from the past. The muse in question does not always follow a conventional set of aesthetic nor value assignations. They may not have any historical value at all or may even be abandoned structures resulting from a failed development. In fact, we have now taken over three major failed development and managed to convince developers that some of their mistakes we can try to fix without demolishing them. These next few years will perhaps be some of the most challenging, uh, very much like what Lacaton Vassal does uh, in France. We've taken the idea that buildings that have already been built, even if it's not done, is still worth rethinking. It's very easy for architects to have the tabula rasa mindset to be able to just say, well, if they can afford it, we'll just demolish it. I urge all of you to really rethink this strategy. Just because it can be done doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, this hotel, which was technically our first architectural project, close during COVID. So part of this memory can only be encased within this video and many of the videos that we've taken. So the next project, uh, we call it the Relic Shelter, actually brings me back uh, to my grandparents or my parents' hometown, not so much Fuzhou, but an hour away. Um, so this is aw uh, about two hours away from Xiamen. So the project draws inspiration from this imagery uniquely associated with Fuzhou, the Jingshan Temple. In the album Fuzhou and the River Min, which documented 
his legendary journey up the Min River, Thompson captured the ancient structure in its original state, resting serenely above a floating rock in 1871. This would become a lasting image identified with the city of Fuzhou, down south, for those of you that do not know China, where our next project is situated. This is a rare example of a temple structure built in the middle of a river in China. John Thompson was one of the first photographers ever to travel to the country and provided Western audiences with some of the first glimpses into the Far East. Professor Wu also cites Thompson's work as those images that gave the world the first visuals of ruinous buildings in China, since they were absent, absent from the tradi traditional painting. The client brief posed the challenge of creating an enclosure for the wooden structure of a high-ranking Qing Dynasty's house. As to how accurate this is, I don't know. But since the client told me so, I had no choice. But you have to remember, we were asked to do a tea house, and we've already, we were in the middle of a schematic design. Six weeks into the thing, we had two different schemes. And then out the blue, he bought this old house, and he said, I want this old house to be inside your building. I'm like, wait a minute, this, this is impossible. So we had to go back to the drawing board because this particular house, apparently from the Qing Dynasty, is so important to him. Well, this building was relocated from Anhui, so how accurate is it really? Is it really from the Qing Dynasty? I start questioning. But when a client asks you to do things and you really want to do a project, you just speculate at the possibility that this is not true, but you leave it at that. So we were asked to enshrine it as the inhabitable centerpiece of a new tea house. So what did we do? We went to the drawing board and realized this idea of a containment. So this project illustrates containment wherein the original ruined structure is treated as a precious artifact around which a new building is erected to house. Physically contained in this new structure, the relationship between new and old structure is one of contrast, but also it complements one another with its dialogue. The entire building is conceived of as a relic shelter, an enclosure that enshrines the architectural ruin as an object on display. The significance of the original relic is reinforced by the floor plan, which also reflects the idea of containment. You see that building, the old building, right in the middle. So we first envisioned the projects as a house atop, just like Thompson's photograph, atop a rock. The tea house is elevated above a ram concrete base. The copper roof echoes the roof line of the enclosed relic. The old structure, as you can see from the slit, is nested in the interior of the building, surrounded by new, heavy, carved base constructed of ram concrete. Capping off this intricate network of passages is a copper-clad roof whose hovering presence is accentuated with a glazing strip that introduces light into the space, visually lifting the heavy roof, perhaps the new, massing from the ground. So as you enter, you actually see a snippet of the old and also understand the shelter that encases it. Upon entering, you are confronted with this old relic. It is only upon looking up will you have a glimpse of the new. It is only upon reaching the mezzanine does the play of new and old starts to interrupt that the structural configuration of the building begin to reveal itself. The hovering metal roof is list lifted above, as I said, above the solid base to introduce a continuous illumination around its periphery. The mezzanine space allows one to see intricate details of the relic structure at eye level. This serves as the cover of the last issue of Damas when guest editor John Novell asked the question, are we entitled to modify the past? The basement level includes a secondary arrival lobby housing a rotunda, a sunken courtyard, and tasting rooms, um, some of which uh, were part of the owner's collection, tea collection. 
and you can see sort of the intermediate space, uh, the rotunda uh, that brings light uh, into the basement floor. The act of containment is instinctively understood in architecture as a means to enclose and shelter. To contain something imp implies that a certain boundary, border, or perimeter is first drawn to demarcate a space. Containment is related to a desire to reinforce an object's status and celebrate its existence by protecting and shielding. When an object is contained, it has the ability to retain its own objecthood while still coexisting, even subsumed, into a larger extended framework. <laughs> the one thing about videos is so that I can also drink water and rest. You see this tension of old and new um, clearly on the mezzanine level. And you also understand the structure of this old structure uh, quite clear from up above. So I'm worried about time, so I'm going to go to the third scheme, OK? If you guys are interested in this video, you can ask me later. So in contrast to content containment, uh, this next project uses dispersion both as a material experience and spatial organization. The main material strategy integrates new with old by utilizing reclaimed bricks to build new walls to create a wellness retreat compound. This is the site as we were given next to the Slender West Lake in Yangzhou. The client was quite a visionary. He argues that buildings uh, or sites that are ma in major cities are important to preserve, but the rural areas are equally important. So before starting, we studied some of the vernacular condition. There were traditional clusters of courtyard and some hybrid transformation through the years, either from functional needs or planning variations and codes. So we walk around the city, visited a near nearby relic, an important garden called Guyan. And Guyan is a very interesting, um, not only as a garden and a landscape, it is also, right in front of it, a house owned by a salt merchant who was at one point apparently a district mayor of Yangzhou. So like many other classical Chinese garden, Guyan is a manifestation of the Taoist ideal of being one with nature. It also serves, these walls also serves as firewalls. And this became the most memorable uh, feature from our visit, which sort of became the conceptual foundation for, our very pro for this particular project. So you can kind of see the vernacular attitude of this particular uh, project. And in fact, the alleyway, some of them are rather perspectival. Um, and definitely, we extracted vernacular elements from here, including the walls that gives hierarchy to the spaces and how the alley creates vistas, but how the court frames the sky and earth and how they encapsulate landscape into architecture and often blurs both the built and the landscape, the exterior and the interior. And you see this particular sky, which is very common. Uh, probably if you understand courtyard um, houses, and yet in Yangzhou, it was a cluster uh, highly mutated at times. But for our project, this was relevant, and I'll tell you why, if we were to go back to our site. The design brief called for adaptive reuse of several of the old buildings. Strangely enough, by the time we came to the rural area, a lot of the government officials have caught on with the idea of preservation. But their understanding of preservation is perhaps a still a little bit elemental, meaning they want to preserve everything, including the bad ones. Um, granting trying to preserve things is a very subjective uh, exercise. But for them, it became a bit ridiculous when they told me, 
I don't really care if you don't preserve the building, but the footprint I want you to preserve. And so after rounds and rounds of negotiation with the district mayor and the head of planning in Yangzhou, and I'm like, why? He says, well, don't just ask why. If you're interested in this building, and so my client goes, just don't ask questions, Lyndon, don't be too critical about this whole thing. Because he wanted this piece of land, and he argues that many of these rural area need to be revitalized, otherwise a lot of the rural area in China is dying. So we thought this is an interesting exercise given the fact that this client had uh, hired eight different architects in different rural area. Um, uh, Huali did something in Xiamen uh, along um, next to Atulo, which was absolutely beautiful. Uh, Junya Ishigami is finishing one now. Um, in different parts of the rural area, some of them you probably don't even know. So, but by updating new function while adding new buildings, we decided how do we formulate a system in which to connect all these. This building, the site plan was rather not just confusing, but it was all over the place. There was really no logic to this. So we imposed a grid, a different kind of grid, to give not an order, but using it as a connector to tie the buildings together, forming a network of fortified walls and covered walkways. And you see sort of the transformation of the site plan uh, with the rooms, some of them in between, but you can kind of see what we're ta talking about. The corridor became that connector. From this aerial view, we see a clear orthogonal orientation. The planning department mandated that we only build, as I said, on existing footprint. So as a strategy, we formed covered walkways, be it alleyways, some of them steps that lead you up so that you can see the slender lake, to organize zones, to guide circulations, and also to define and wrap the buildings within. By extracting elements from the vernacular typology seen in the Guyuan Garden and sub uh, other buildings around that area, we not only created something that reminds people of the past, but something entirely contemporary, something belonging just for this project. The adjacent ponds and landscape you see, in fact, right now it's so outgrown, it's it actually hardly recognizable uh, because the, the landscape has really taken over. Uh, so some of these buildings, I'll show you as you enter the building. Uh, this outdoor theater, there's a lot of chairs there now. This was taken after construction, after we finished construction about two and a half years ago. Um, alleyways made of reclaimed brick. You can walk around the site using the pathway to discover your rooms. Once within, there's a clear separation between the building and the walls, a layering of privacy and a sliver of landscape for guests to enjoy. Journeying along these walls, you mark your experience by engaging with the varying sight lines, sensing different kinds of horizon and datum lines. You can also ascend, as I told you a while ago, through openings above to gain privileged viewpoints of the slender lake that look out across the gridded landscape and beyond to the surrounding lakes. This is the reception where you check in, the courtyard while you wait, um, some of the furnitures, uh, many of, we are a multidisciplinary practice, uh, and so we build many of these furniture. Some people have asked me, why are these a little fatter? Some of the profile, I said, well, we had to build with uh, rural carpenters, and they refused to do our details, so there were a lot of negotiation, but I have to tell you, I learned a lot from them. Um, and in the process, we're introducing a series of fatter, shorter furniture very much like my profile, so it's perfect. Um, so you see the above uh, sunken uh, conversation pit, um, the private courtyard within the rooms, uh, built in condition, both the furniture uh, and the custom pieces. Um, So this project was first inspired by the tradi traditional alleyways and courtyards found in its vernacular past. With some careful rethinking about the retreat program and the movement of the guests between rooms, landscape, and common facilities. 
Here we worked with a non-urban site where the existing buildings were mostly demolished. But these buildings liked their ghost footprints. So the design came from a reworking of these found imprints. How, we asked ourselves, could we use them to recast a new vernacular? A new vernacular that can give hope and a future for many people that have left their own home to urban places for a better future, sometimes leaving their family for a better pay. And yet they are in cities, in places that they're not comfortable with, in jobs that they're not good at. Farmers becomes driver, bricklayers becomes janitor, and oftentimes frustration arise. Families become broken, and in the process, marriages are never restored. We sought for this recasting to service new functions for the future use, but still retain the nuanced sensibility so intrinsic to Yangzhou's heritage and way of life. When we talk about way of life, it's not just about architecture. It's also about the social structure ingrained in many of this village. The recycled bricks collected from Yangzhou and five different villages around the area are reassembled on site as pathways connecting courtyards and buildings. By dispersing reclaimed materials as opposed to containment, the act of destruction of another relic becomes part of the new building and gives newfound relevance to what was once cast and discarded as construction waste. Dispersion in this project also applies to its spatial organization since all the courtyard spaces are scattered within the matrix of the grid walls. The spaces are themselves dispersed and not contained, creating a garden or landscape approach where the visitors experience unfolding vignettes that recur episodically throughout their journey. Threshold in this particular case are less defined. Boundaries are less clear, blurring the lines between old and new. Ruinophilia in this process becomes something that we don't fetish, but rather experience. Older ladies and gentlemen would come from different villages, recognizing all the bricks from their hometown, and there would be that sense of pride that this too is their home. Brick layers that help brick that build this hotel would come to me later and says thank you for bringing me back home. I said, don't thank me. It's a client's vision, and it is him you have to thank. And it is really his aspiration to main, bring many of these people who are completely depressed in cities to come to the villages that they belong to. And that sense of coming home, yearning to come home, as I talked about, that nostos, that pain, sometimes maybe a little bit longer than expected, becomes a realization for many of them. I was supposed to put the one-minute video. I forgot, it's a three-minute video. I hope you guys are not very hungry because we still have three projects, so <clears throat> I hope our project will be able to fe feed your soul uh, to a point where in hunger is no longer relevant to you. <laughs> and this person's about to close the door, so I know my videographer hates it when I do this, but for the lack of time and the other respect for University of Toronto, I'm gonna skip. The next project, just before we go to the three other architecture project is um, small uh, product design. Some of you might have seen it, but it's only fair because my partner, Rosanna, is not here with me. 
that I bring her, her presence to the University of Toronto. And she will be here appearing in this video with me. So Jaguar is a sponsor. I just want you to know. So that's the reason why. If we have high accolades on Jaguar, there's a reason. I had to say that. From a tea set to a candle holder to a necklace. So some of you are probably familiar with our uh, set, um, tea set, made out of zisa. So the next project, um, we call it uh, Void Aranya Art Center. Many of you that are following Chinese architecture have heard the word Aranya as a developer. Uh, it's, he's considered a very enlightened uh, developer. He's hired many um, architects, many of them my friends, uh, colleagues. Um, and so imagine when we got a phone call uh, to do a project in Qinghuangdao, which is three hours east of Beijing. I was extremely excited. So some of you have been to China, so you probably know that the Lonely Library by Vector Architects, uh, Dong Kong's project, uh, the chapel uh, is in this development. And you know those projects, uh, Huang Wenjing and Li Hu's project, Open Architecture, is all of them faces this beautiful beach resort. So, of course, naturally, when I got this call, I'm like, uh, where is my piece of property facing the beach? <laughs> That's a natural assumption. So I was really excited. I called Dong Kong, I called Zhang Ke. They all have this beautiful site. And they said, oh, welcome to the club. And so I said, wow, this is great. It's a little crowded. Where could my site possibly be? So I just said yes without really knowing what the site is. Well, I was so disappointed when the developer said, well, look at this beautiful uh, faux Mediterranean village, and I want you to build right in the middle of it. And by then, I just saw this picture, and I still, you know, in black and white, this was exactly how he sent it to me. I thought, well, it's okay, it's not bad. Well, not really, because it truly looked like, he goes, doesn't it look like Spanish village? Um, and he argues, that if 7% of his development is given to public costs, designed very well by good architects, that second homes away from uh, Beijing or Shanghai, that the price actually will be attractive. That people, if they have, uh, if they come to their second home and there's actually legitimate program in arts and music and culture, that there will be more people who will come to their second home. So he is a visionary, but you can kind of see how 
Um, well, in this image, it actually looks pretty okay. But um, it was garish at best. Um, <clears throat> so what we decided to do was to create our own landscape. I decided I'm just going to not care about the context. Don't do that, okay? Uh, but in this particular case, it's probably what we should do. Uh, given the fact that there was really no context to abide by sight lines, none of this, because they were all fake. So we decided to carve an inner circle and create our own landscape where we framed the sky and filled this auditorium with water. So we took this opportunity to question the notion of space versus art. Uh, what is a communal space? What does it really mean for them to gather together? And in the middle of this uh, fake Mediterranean village, how is landscape brought in? These were original sketches, uh, some of my sketches. Uh, Rosanna called them uh, chicken scratches. Um, but it shows you the intent of creating an atrium looking to the sky and filling the courtyard uh, with a body of water. We were really inspired by, I don't know if you know this, maybe a lot of you are very young. I was in uh, Mexico City and I saw Legoreta's um, um, hotel that was built in 1965 that had that central uh, big deep with a dip with, with big uh, wave of water. I, I was really, it was mesmerizing. I always thought of that and trying to uh, make something out of that in my building and I managed to do that here, albeit a lot smaller. So the scheme maximizes its outer footprint but carves out a pure conical geometry at the center with a stepping amphitheater at the best, uh, at the base. Um, so this is not just a place of display, uh, all the containment, but we thought, what if the center becomes something that's activated so it's not just uh, a museum? So we had to convince the client that can it potentially, uh, instead of the theater being inside, can it be outside? Uh, initially he says no, so I just went along with it. So he thought this round circle at the top has a glass roof. So, of course, um, I didn't like that idea. Uh, but, you know, you have to move along with the project. So it was during the opening, he was, what happened to the glass? Uh, I said, I decided that it's best to have the open um, amphitheater. It took another six months when a lot of people actually used it, did he um, agree to have it open. So I hope it stays open for a while. Um, it's composed primarily of various uh, textured concrete, some with aggregate and the base, mostly with aggregate to kind of define this foundational datum line. And the facade and materiality of the building is heavy in nature, like a solid rock. Um, actually, that's the, he used the word rock as a reference in terms of as a foundational um, centerpiece for this village. Um, smooth surfaces reflect the changing sky right in the middle. Uh, you will see uh, this particular articulation. If you look closely, a lot of them uh, within the window, even though it's modest in its palette, uh, we have a touch of intricacy by adding uh, bronze details uh, around the building. This is the corner entrance. Uh, within the thick mass, of course, of the building is a series of interlocking spaces that visitors can meander freely within, slowly ascending, enjoying a choreographed journey with directed views both inward and outward. And gallery spaces are about the enjoyment of art, but at the same time, a view of the possibility of a community within. That spiraling path leads you through all the spaces, urging you onward by the desire to see more. And so this is that middle space, um, the gallery spaces that allow you to enjoy the art at moments, also take your view upwards towards the sky. This is that landscape that we want to capture. Um, in Chinese, there's a word called jieqing, borrowing landscape. Uh, we thought this would be an interesting phenomenon uh, from a public component. And you see the body of water here. Mostly it's filled. And during the first few months, it was filled. But there were so many events and so many people wanting to use this. You hardly actually see the water. It's always drained, unfortunately. So the central void space can be reconfigured and used in many ways, as I described. A water feature when filled with water, but also a functional performance and gathering place when the water is drained. Borrowing from Martin Heidegger's seminal text, Building, Dwelling, Thinking, the boundary is not a point of termination, but a point where presencing begins. Rooted in the notion of contrast, many of our projects use opposition 
to heighten and reveal the dialectics of inside outside and the part to the whole. The notion of absence or void for us can be understood in relation to a Chinese concept of rhinophilia. Unlike European ruins, ancient Chinese structures were often constructed out of wood, leaving behind only their foundations as traces of their original grandeur. Evident in its etymology, the word of ruin, which evolved from the word chiu to shi, indicates that over time the concept of the architectural ruin was increasingly freed from the external visual signs relying on illusion rather than direct literal representation. Which brings me to a project of presence. I talk about absence, I'm contrasting it with presence. This project is about an hour and a half away, an hour and a half away from Shanghai uh, in a general vicinity of Jiangnan. What was interesting, and I quickly took this uh, because to give people a context, this is an old village uh, further left. Uh, this was a project that was master uh, planned by uh, Zhang Yonghe, Yonghe Chang, uh, and he did the building, the residential building on the top. Uh, he had the big houses, of course. Uh, he's the godfather of Chinese architecture, so he has the big house, uh, 600 square meter. And we were asked to do the small house. I was like, sure, why not? 400 square meter. And now, actually, ours is sold out partially, not because ours is better, it's because ours is cheaper. Um, imagine 600 square meter, just multiply that with a per square meterage. It's crazy, it's outstanding. Uh, and Calvin Chow in Macau did the hotel in the middle. And in the process of doing this, uh, the developer uh, decided that they needed a signifier, um, uh, um, um, a lantern uh, that would bring about the whole development, that, that sort of, uh, and he wants it to be a chapel. And you know, very similar to development in China, um, oftentimes you get more FAR, floor area ratio, by giving public spaces. And this was that for, for them. And he asked about eight different architects uh, to submit qualification. And to my surprise, many of them didn't want to do it because it connotes a particular restriction and um, the idea of chapel as a typology. Of course, Roseanne and I were stupid enough to just say, well, it's only the religion department. Uh, it should not be a problem. Uh, we can deal with all the constraint and the restriction. Boy, were we wrong. Um, so what we did was we decided uh, in our presentation to the planning board using this painting by Wu Guangzhong, maybe some of you know, um, showing a painterly rendition of a particular kind of vernacular sublime. Okay. This is very much the character of white walls and gray clay tiles found in the Jiangnan uh, water towns. Interestingly, this artist has modernized the traditional ink brush strokes with watercolor, creating a new way of representation not seen before. So we were looking at this integration and asked ourselves that perhaps in the artist's work with ink brush, uh, with watercolor, and marveling at the sensibility of his new medium against the old ink tradition, we asked ourselves perhaps we can, through this harmony, through a way of a sense of collage, that we can find a new articulation for such kind of representation. Some of you might think that's a stretch, but the planning board goes, I like this. I like this, so we don't really talk about the sacred tradition that you're about to propose to us. You understand, there are underground churches, but there are also churches, traditional churches, that are approved for worship in China, but you have to go through uh, an approval process and make sure those typology and the procession is uh, approved. One of them is that you can't just have a sanctuary uh, as, 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 as a space and the only space. You need to create other spaces uh, that would give different people different choices. So if you're intimidated to go to a sanctuary, you can have other public spaces. So we actually took that challenge and ask ourselves if this pathway that leads you to the church could also potentially lead you up to the roof garden, and maybe it is through that exit stairway, that stairway, by widening it, we have a new public space. These are all reclaimed bricks, uh, which starts with refined scale, perhaps rather normal, as it approaches uh, and goes into 
um, the chapel, it intensifies and starts to have different pat patterns. And you see to the right side are the circulation spaces, uh, started with a fire egress that we start to widen, and in the process of doing so, have this relationship with the ma main sanctuary, and have this approach in which uh, spatially it can interrelate uh, and have people go up and down without necessarily uh, entering uh, the chapel. So to a certain extent, we actually spent more time on this space than the chapel itself, um, because we realized the chapel we can do, uh, but maybe this um, was harder. And so we created this uh, stairway that leads one through a different kind of journey. Um, in this rich sensorial uh, experience, the play of light and shadow, uh, the journey that not only leads you to the rooftop, but also leads you to the mezzanine, uh, which you see here, um, clad in wood uh, with a louvered cage, custom lights uh, done by our office. So from the back of the mezzanine, you can also go out uh, to a, pla a different platform that allows you to see uh, the whole village. Um, Tectonically, uh, the white volume is divided into two different materials. The inner layer, a simple concrete box punctuated on all sides with scattered windows. The outer layer is folded, is a folded and perforated metal skin, a veil, if you will, that alternatively hides and reveals. Um, After this, there's one last project, and we're done. And some of you that have requested for certain projects to be shown today, I sincerely apologize if I cannot show you. Um, in fact, I'm already out of time, and I don't even dare look at Dean's, uh, Du Chen's face, because I'm afraid of her uh, facial expression. You'll be surprised um, by visitors that come to this place. Often, they don't necessarily enter the sanctuary immediately. Obviously, the worshipers that come on Sundays, um, because this is one of the approved churches that are allowed to worship, uh, they know what the ritual is. But many that comes and visit, um, especially school children, would actually prefer to go through the steps and have a snippet of the main sanctuary before they enter. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So we're extremely happy that we actually managed to create this, what we call a leftover space, a third space, perhaps it's a threshold. Um, that we mani manipulate it so that it's actually equally spatial as to the main sanctuary. So the last project um, takes a similar approach to using um, another way of obsessions that we have, which is incision and stitching as, a f as formal strategies, but yielding a very different result. So we, now we are in the south of China, 
in Nantou, Shenzhen. Shenzhen is known as a city without a history, but there's a vibrant urban village. And Nantou, uh, which in this particular area is quite relevant. It used to be the central, I won't call it the central business district, but it used to be the central district of vibrant Shenzhen. But if you look at the images beyond those high rises, in fact, this is an old image. There are more high rises. And you know the roll call of star architects, BRK Ingalls, uh, Rem Kulhas, MBRDV, all have different high rises there. Some of them are being constructed, some are under construction, some are in the planning stages. Um, we're never called for those projects, so. Um, we're just happy to be part of this old uh, village. And Wangke, which is a developer, um, in English they call themselves Vanke, uh, V-A-N-K-E, um, had this creative idea to take over 300 of these houses, and some of you might know this project because it was all over the press, uh, maybe about five years ago. Uh, and they had an amazing vision. Uh, they asked Urbanas to come and do this master planning, and they did an amazing job. Uh, and what they did was they hired many different architects, young, um, uh, aspiring architects, to renovate many of these buildings. Um, and and on, on a very low budget, but the idea was to uh, reclaim some of these buildings and give all the owners uh, um, a new possibility and restore a lot of their building. In return, they would rent this building for a low uh, amount and would re rent it for, uh, uh, obviously, to make a profit. And after 12 years, they would give these buildings back to the original owners. And many of them agreed. In fact, almost all of them agreed. And they decided to pick 12 buildings and ask 12 different architects to design a theater, a park, uh, an office center, um, and we were given um, uh, to design a hotel. And so you have y Yongho is doing one, uh, MBRDV completed one, Sejima is about to finish hers, uh, the Vietnamese architect Vo Trong uh, just finished an outdoor theater with, with a big canopy, um, and you know, Herzog de Maron is doing something on the outskirts, so it's quite interesting. Um, kind of mixture of different things. But when we came here, we were really interested by the winding alleyways, uh, hidden corners, dead ends, narrow gap between buildings. They were all inspiration for us. Um, and so these, uh, that yellow building is our building uh, in both elevation. Um, we were to intervene on an eight-story tall existing building and to transform it into an 11-room um, guest room. So this is sort of the image, that's the building. Um, so when I saw it for the first time, I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? And I know what the budget is, exposed pipes. And so again, we, we went back to uh, what Svetlana Boim talks about, rhinophilia. Um, you know, the idea of it being a collapse, but it is usually about the remainders and reminders. Um, she said very beautifully that I want to suggest a different logic of the ruin, which is non-romantic, not Baroque, not melancholic, but a form of toleration of disharmony, a toleration of plural modernities with which we lived. Rediscovered off-modern ruins are not only symptoms, but also sites for new exploration and productions of meaning. We were also reminded of Mata Clark, both his Conical intersect in 1975 from the Paris Biennale and the splitting in Englewood, New Jersey in 1974. In Paris, he uses the radical incision to critique urban development and public role of art. He created the void to offer a view of the structure's internal skeletons, thereby protesting the demolition in the Le Hall area. He was obviously aware of the sustainability and reuse of the environment before sustainability was even fashionable. In splitting the second project, which is probably equally important, he wanted to convert this building into an internalized state of mind. This resonated w very much uh, for both Rosanna and myself uh, with a Chinese notion of ruin as something internalized and absent. So what do we do with this building? 
we decided that many of this window needs to be removed. Uh, it's uh, single uh, glazed. Uh, many of them were broken. We decided, why don't we just keep the tiles? Uh, they were kind of pink salmon color. Uh, we thought maybe perhaps by having a veil around it uh, that we created a, a new layer to it, a new dimension. Um, so this is what we have. Um, you see the pink and then we would then ca uh, have concrete uh, patches around the broken uh, divides. There are two entrances, one in the alleyway. This is Urbanus's building. Uh, there's that existing uh, Urbanus building is to the right, and this particular building as well. Uh, Doreen Liu, I don't know if you know her, uh, has a building here. Um, and so that's one of the side pathway. This is the main entrance uh, to the public uh, space from the piazza. Uh, from the cafe inside, you see a lot of the built uh, custom furniture uh, and lights that we've designed. Um, but what was the most uh, radical thing we did uh, was through the alleyway. Uh, what we did was we create this incision and inserted this new stairway that leads you to the different rooms. The stairway is open uh, to the elements. Uh, the public gesture of opening up the building along the urban axis is then turn upward. An existing stairwell that previously connected all nine of the tenement floors was cut open and expanded, creating a new vertical incision that allows a natural element to pass through. If you see the exploded uh, axon, you can understand our fascination to celebrate life in the urban village. The existing structure was cut into a massing strategy, allowing such urban incision to foster a new public realm on the inside the previously private apartment block. The contrast and tension between old and new, uh, past and present are very much part of the spatial and sectional experience of this project. Old and new are juxtaposed throughout the building to celebrate ruins, not just as symbols or reminders of the past, but following Boehm's assertion that ruins can take on a different logic, which is not romantic, not Baroque, not melancholic, but a form of toleration of disharmony. Uh, we have a um, bathtub uh, that we've designed for Agape Casa. They're a lot smaller and a lot very t similar to Japanese and Chinese tub when they're smaller, most of them made in wood. Uh, obviously, this is different, but it's a little bit uh, um, uh, taller, so you actually immerse yourself. Um, pieces, I know some of you are product designers here, just so this is a token uh, image for all of you, <laughs> so you don't get upset at me. So the staircase function like this hanging walkways and traditional kultsan. Um, now, if you've been to hotels in China, oftentimes when you're in the alleyway, you would hear noises, yeah? especially in the villages, because people have a habit of opening their door. I don't know if you know this. Uh, and so you smell what they're cooking, uh, or, or you know, uh, if they're doing noodles, or they're chatting, they're so loud, the walkways. So we decided that this was going to happen. So we did, uh, we just decided to make this door uh, operable, wherein it could be halfway open, so you have, uh, you know, sunset can be really hot, uh, so you have cross breeze. But at the same time, you could also be part of the public. Um, and therefore, this became quite an interesting phenomena. In fact, someone in my office is here who did this project in this particular program. Uh, she did an amazing uh, job on some of the interior projects, so um, I would ask her to stand up, but I think that would be too embarrassing for her. Uh, so weather-treated steel doors and wall panels have been inserted within the gridded original concrete structure, hinting at the sheltered private spaces behind. Like the bustling alleys below, the roofscape across Nanto has a life of its own, with makeshift gardens and vegetable farms popping up along the jagged skylines. Stitch and incision, both surgical in nature, speak to Nairin Hu's archaeological approach of peeling back the layers in the spirit of Gautam Mata Clark, whose self-described works are about making space without building it, near in whose projects express techniques of erosion and erasure, calibrated to produce a new unexpected spatial readings. Remnants are woven together by recomposing an assemblage of found fragments to unify the parts. In Mata Clark's works, the buildings are the bodies upon which acts of disruption Deconstruction and deletions are enacted to alter one's spatial orientation. Viewing between the gaps, 
fissures and bored apertures, the visitor suddenly gains a newfound awareness of the precarious relationships between rooms, chambers, and urban contexts. In contrast, the act of stitching requires a more labored effort. Stitching demands a certain finesse where alignment and precision determine its success. Sarah Whiting challenges the term adaptive reuse in the article she wrote on our project in Domus magazine, offering another term. She calls it seamless synthesis. As her preference to meaning, to mean something that unlocks intellectual horizons and other worlds with particular magical precision. Perhaps it is through this quiet synthesis, she argues, that is meant to mass or distract, but neither is it meant to call attention to itself. Hopefully with this and the other projects I have shown today, and many of them not shown today, which cross divides between the past and the future, between typologies, between locations and cultures, between traditional design practice and alternative programs and functions. We are able to bring forth new meanings to architecture by its ability to construct new relationships and borrowing from Terence Hawke's words, perceive those that are between them. Perhaps it is in the marginal spaces, the in-between, the third spaces, the neglected spaces, or the third spaces, as I said, coined by Homi Baba, that we find new meaning and purpose in architecture. As a French philosopher once said, we do not aspire to be eternal beings. We only hope that things do not lose its meaning and purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lyndon. Um, I, I don't have a stern expression on, although <laughs> we don't have much time left for <laughs> questions. Uh, so I will, I will skip mine, and I will go directly to the audience for any questions um, that we have for this wonderful journey uh, that Lyndon has brought us through their projects. Um, I can't see, are there any hands? Everyone's rushing to go to dinner. Uh, there's Please uh, make sure to save desserts for me, for those of you that just left the room. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that, um, a slightly obnoxious question, to try and put your approach into a, a local context, or at least a North American context. How do you approach working in a place that has less history, if I can put it in more prov in a provocative way, um, you know, fewer layers uh, and a shorter uh, chronology. Um, does that affect the way in which you affect uh, approach a particular place or site? Ah, uh, yes, it's actually quite interesting because um, lately, in fact, fifty percent of our work now, the last three years, are outside of China. Um, <coughs> Whether this is very smart of us or kind of stupid of us, three years ago, we decided to enter competitions, paid competition nonetheless, and we thought to ourselves, well, if for every competition, we, uh, if for every two competition, we might win one, or maybe for every three, the chances was, what, 33%. We entered five, no, six competition, and we won four. Some of them are uh, projects or areas that actually are all rather new without much of a patina, very similar to that fake Mediterranean uh, village I showed you. But what was interesting is as Rafael Maneo, who was my thesis advisor at Harvard, would, um, I would hear his voice constantly telling me, Lyndon, just because there's no context doesn't mean there's, just because there's no physical context doesn't mean there's no context that the sociolo uh, sociological framework of a community is a context in itself. And the most important thing is to be critical wherever you go. And if you understand history 
and how history can become a powerful tool for you to understand how to build than sensibility and being, um, um, being sort of the servant of the built environment and being humble in the, your approach will come naturally. So that, that would be my answer. I don't have an answer for you because you will have to judge three years later if I'm allowed to come back and lecture with some of our new projects uh, in Cape Town, for instance, um, in Italy. S some of them are new, new uh, villages. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting, or new developments for that matter. While Ali is delivering the micro, I, I, I perhaps I slip something in there in the actual Linden uh, and Rosanna prior to setting their, their own office in Shanghai actually worked for many years, so Linden for 10 years for Michael Graves. So the much of this attitude towards history and the multi layers of history and modernity's relationship to past history, I, I feel it's it's both conceptual and architectural. So it, it, for me, it, it has been really interesting to observe how your work in the past 15 years um, from the Waterhouse Hotel and as it evolved, uh, but I also s see affinities and similarity to some of the projects you were working, you were both working on, even when you were working for Michael's office in Shanghai mm -hmm. in, in some of the work. So uh, it, it is, I, I, uh, I almost wanted to ask a, a follow-up question is that, to say how do you then take into the third, third stage, right? The first stage is taking these co conceptual methodologies back to China, developing a very unique language and method, uh, very unique to that local context, because many of the issues, whether it's demolition, renewal, rural urban migration, it's so specific to time and place, and then now, um, retranslating that to different contexts, whether it's in the African continent, in Hong Kong, in Europe. Um, it, it, it is quite exciting to, for, to observe, and I, I wonder... It's, it's nerve-wracking, I wonder, how do you feel? Yes, yeah. it is quite nerve-wracking. In fact, we would enter competitions and um, would be rather timid in our presentation because we're not so sure. But it's interesting enough because our... Um, timidity is seen as humility. Uh, and so I think we got three of out of our four projects, not necessarily because it's the best scheme, but because it's the possibility of client being able to have an input and then uh, the, having that conversation. And that became very important for us. Uh, and the client's um, knowledge is equally important to us and the lay of the land. Um, we're working on literally about eight projects outside of China now. I'm talking about architecture, I'm not even talking about interiors. Uh, and a lot of them are pretty large, so I'm actually a little worried. <laughs> no humility at all, I see. <laughs> uh, and let's see. Sorry, my, my cropping. Yep, in the front. Uh, you should, because we have audience online as well. Yeah, it's coming to you. Thank you. Uh, you made mention on one of your projects about the craftspeople or having to, to work through something. And a lot of the projects that you showed are very craftspeople heavy. Do you have a crew that you bring along with you? Or are you constantly training people as you go? Maybe talk a little bit about that process. And it's really interesting now that you're doing projects outside of that region and how you're going to adapt some of that as well? So that's a very good question. Uh, we're not like Studio Mumbai, right? Bijoy Jean has a crew of people that actually moves from one project to another. Um, lately, Bijoy had told me that uh, actually they, he no longer employs them because it's too much pressure. Uh, what he does is uh, his office has gone from like a very big office to very small. When I talk about big offices, not just architects, it's also bricklayers, carpenters. Um, and he's now, sh uh, sh uh, it's now sh uh, shrunk into about five people. But then he would collaborate to, with a lot of these people that have worked with him in the past. So I envy that every time uh, because we're not as, as, as efficient, we're not as smart. Uh, that strategy would have really worked because actually design built is a phenomena. Um, 
in China that's very much prevalent, especially among interior designers. But what worries me about that, and many of my friends that have that kind of practice, tend to start worrying about cost cutting in the building side, right? And it, it, there's that conflict of interest because they start to say, well, maybe you should not be using plywood, or maybe you should not be using this brick, maybe you should not be using stone. Um, and so for us, it's about retraining and re, and it is really tiring, to be honest. So what we do is we have sets and uh, um, drawings of details, uh, and we're constantly using mocked up, and it's in our office. So what happened is once a contractor is appointed, we always invite them to our office. And as soon as you come to the office, that's what we do with students as well. Yeah? My Harvard students and Yale students, I don't tell them you got a big build, big models made out of cast. I just bring them to Shanghai. And as soon as they enter my office, they're like, okay, we know what the expectations are, right? And it's what we call the immersion of uh, what we value. So a lot of contractors would come in and they would look at all the details that's displayed all over our office and they're like, Oh, some of them would say, oh, the fee is too low. <laughs> uh, what we quoted is too low based on this. So they would either pull out or they would say, okay, it's okay. This is a project we want to do. Uh, but that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge now. We're doing a project in Minnesota. Um, I'll tell you a story uh, with Julie Snow. Um, and she's doing this uh, beautiful hotel and we're doing the interior, but we're doing, there's this old part, we're doing the new component of it and we're doing the interior. And the client, we had a hard time because the budget was going up and I said, why don't I have a proposal? Why don't we make the whole room in China and just ship it over here? And he thought I was crazy. He says, with the tax and the, all that, it'll be, with the tax and everything, when it came all in, it was still 30% cheaper. And when we walked in the room, Rosanna and I, last month, we were shocked because we were like, whoa, there's nothing wrong with it because we already saw it in Shanghai. It just got shipped here uh, it, like kits and parts and it got put together and the clients were excited, you know. And of course we said, well, you have that 30%, maybe you should spend more <laughs> on the furniture. <laughs> they didn't buy that. So I, um, because of the time, if there's further questions for Lyndon, perhaps we can do it over refreshments uh, just out there. Uh, I want to thank Hello. Lyndon for a wonderful talk tonight. Um, and, you know, as this is the last public lecture of the season, I also want to remind everyone that we currently have two wonderful exhibitions in, in the building right now. Uh, just behind the hall, we have recent works by Marina Tablesome Architects. Uh, Linda, I know you're, you know Marina as well. Um, she is this year's Frank Gehry International Visiting Chair in Architectural Design at the school. And her office's work, which in includes institutional, cultural, and residential projects, is known for its close attention to climate adaptability, context, craft, and history. You'll see a beautiful sampling of the work through videos, drawings, and models right here. And downstairs in our architecture and design gallery, we have the resolutions for the Antarctic International Stations and Antarctic Data Space. We just launched the exhibition two weeks ago. It's curated by Onless, a nonprofit agency devoted to interdisciplinary research on extreme environments threatened by climate change. It's a multimedia exhibition showcasing the works of more than 200 contributors, scientists, architects, and designers whose collective effort to document and protect the uniqueness of the continent that now is under threat. So with that, I want to uh, fi final thank you to Lyndon for joining us and, and being you. able to show us this great work. And thank all of you who's joining us in this room. Uh, this wraps up. I, I hope we, uh, many of you have enjoyed, uh, I, I think, a pretty stellar roster of people we've been able to bring to the school and the conversations we've been having both within the school and with a lot of, of our community partners, 
uh, it's really great to see a lot of architects from outside of the city, uh, outside of the school in the city as well. So we really appreciate having you as part of the extended community at Daniel's faculty. And we look forward to welcoming you and welcoming Lyndon in a few years when he come back to show us his other wonderful work to come back to the school and, and to discuss and share the experimentation and innovation that's necessary for all of us to work together. Thank you very much.